This is Melissa, and today is the 22nd of October, 2023, and I've not been well this week, so forgive the ragged quality of my voice. I didn't post a real history. I did record something, but I did not have the energy to complete it and post it. So that will go up on the 26th, and I've tentatively entitled it Jankness. It was a fun conversation and, and the last time that I really felt well. So I did not have a lot of energy for anything this week, but I tried to look at news when I could and listen to a few things of interest and, and just think. And so what I'm going to talk about is the summation of some of the things that I looked at and thought about this week. I noticed that aid is going into Gaza. They have opened up the border between Egypt and the Gaza Strip, and they've allowed 20 trucks in. Now, more than half of the 2.3 million inhabitants of the Palestinians have, have fled. Mm, the remaining are there rationing water and food, and aid workers say that there are about 200 trucks gathered there with some 3,000 tons of supplies, but they have not been allowed in. There is a, a law firm in the U.S. called Davis Polk that had made offers to three students from Harvard and Columbia, but they rescinded those offers when they discovered that these students had been involved in uh, writing of protest letters. And so... What came out of these protest letters, and I think with Harvard there were some 30 different student organizations which co-signed a letter holding the Israeli regime entirely responsible for all unfolding violence. And at Columbia University there were about 20 student organizations that issued a joint statement with you know similar sentiment. It said the weight of responsibility for the war and casualties undeniably lies with the Israeli extremist government and other Western governments, including the U.S. government, which fund and staunchly support Israeli aggression, apartheid, and settler colonization. So the law firms had offered jobs to these students, and then they are finding that they're involved in these letters, so they're pulling the offers away. We'll see what comes, but there are other, in this article, which I'll post, it mentions a, a couple of other companies that are um, using a similar technique. They will not be employing young students fresh from university who have expressed criticism of Israel. I've mentioned before um, Alan's cutting through book in the first volume. Well, I should say that all of his volumes talk about the system of control. That is essentially what the work is about. It's how this ancient system works and helping you to think non-linearly, learn to think maybe uh, by seeing visuals and symbols and starting to recognize the system that we're all born into. And he talks about how easy it is to do because conclusions that are faulty are passed from parent to child, generation to generation, and we come to our erroneous conclusions. And this is the technique of imprisoning the mind. And Alan writes, this technique of imprisoning the mind was well understood from antiquity up into the Industrial Revolution when only an elite comprised of nobility, priests, and the officers of the military had education. Control was fairly simple. The body was threatened with physical death and the spirit with eternal damnation. This enabled a tiny minority in ancient Egypt to live at the pinnacle of luxury from Luxor for 5,000 years. Luxor means place of light. It was a royal and priestly capital of learning, the common Egyptian was in the dark. One of the things that I uh, noticed this week, I, I had, I still had Gog and Magog on my mind, and so I was doing a little hunting around on that topic, and I found an article that had been published 
in the times of Israel. And the, the timing was interesting to me because it was published on October the 5th and this Hamas attack on Israel was on the 7th. So the title says, The Gog and Magog people are gone, and it is time now for Isaiah's visions. Gog and Magog are a pair of names that appear in the Bible and the Quran, variously ascribed to individuals, tribes, lands, or nature's catastrophes. In the first mention of these peoples, Ezekiel 38, Gog is an individual and Magog is his land. By the time of the New Testament's Revelation 28, Jewish tradition had already changed Ezekiel's Gog from Magog into Gog and Magog. Now, this is a lengthy article, not too long, but longer than I my voice wants to read today, and I will post it for you to look at. But there, the two things I want to point out is that so much hinges on Solomon's temple. And I just want you, long-time listeners will know, of course, the role that Solomon's temple plays in Freemasonry. But I also want to point out here that what this writer was positing is that Ezekiel's vision was this enemy, Gog, and Isaiah's vision was a time when the peoples, the Arabs and the Hebrews, lived together in peace in that region. And so what the author of this article is saying is, if you look at the history of the 20th century and all of the bloodshed and the disease, the wars, perhaps the time of Gog and Magog has passed. And that is kind of an interesting point of view, though, because in the Jewish eschatology, it, it coincides with the coming of their Messiah and then a relative peace on earth. And so far as I've noticed, no one has declared the coming of the Jewish Messiah. So there are lots of interesting things, and I should have prefaced this by saying I am not a religious scholar, but I do find this interesting. I listened to, I uh, watched a video that featured um, an, an American rabbi, and his name is Reuven Lafner. Reuven Lafner. And he had a sense of humor. Uh, and he, I, it was a short little video, and I, I post it for you, and you can watch it. And someone in this, it was a, a talk about Jewish eschatology. And eschatology is a big word for end times, so end times prophecies. And you will see that Islam, uh, Christianity, Judaism, they have eschatology, end time prophecies. And you know, other religions, you know, Hinduism has, you know, they have apocalyptic, cataclysmic um, f foreshadowings and prophecies in their writing. But what it, ha what it really interests me with my limited understanding is the well, they're, they're quite striking similarities in, in the end time prophecies between these three religions. So, someone in the audience asked Rabbi Lofer about Gog and Magog. And he said, well, first of all, it is not Gog and Magog. It is Gog from Magog, or Magog. He's pronounced it a little differently. But anyway, he said... Gog as the king of Magog, and he said we viewed Magog, he, he, he would not pinpoint where that was, he said it's just a bad place in the north. And here's where his sense of humor came in, he said a, a dark and evil place in the north, like where they make those triangular chocolates. So anybody who's a chocolate lover, as I am, will know that he was referring to Toblerone chocolates, which are triangular, made by the Swiss people. And I do not think that Rabbi Lofer was asserting that the Swiss were the ancient biblical enemy of Israel. 
So I, I, I did a little um, looking around, too, to see, you know, just who else, who on earth, where, what are they, are they saying about what's going on in the Middle East? And one thing I stumbled upon, which was interesting to me, were all of the different astrologers who had done charts and had interpretations of what was going on and the significance of what was going on. And I've, I've never gotten too deep into astrology and I didn't watch very many of these, but one that I watched was a a pleasant youngish woman who was charting the attack, the time, the exact time, to the best of her understanding, that the Hamas had launched the attack. And then she was showing the different points and conjunctions, and she had lines, and it was all very interesting. But the... Uh, <laughs> The thing that really struck me is that she tied it all back in. She said, now, one could make a case here that this all goes back to sex slavery because you have Sarah in the Bible. She sold her Egyptian slave or handmaiden, Hagar. Um, and I don't know that you'd say that she sold her, but... Um, basically got her to give a baby to her husband, Abram, that, that that was Abraham. So Abraham is the father of the Abrahamic religions, and Sarah was his wife, and she was unable to bear him a child, a son, and she got him Hagar as his concubine. So this woman doing the astrological chart, tied everything that's going on right now in the Middle East back to sex slavery. And then someone sent me something uh, from a Christian minister in the U.S., and I, I won't say his name, it doesn't really matter, but, what, but he was from a church called Cornerstone. And there are a lot of churches called Cornerstone, so knock yourself out. But what is interesting about the Cornerstone, what they say is that the cornerstone is the first stone without which the building cannot stand. That is Freemasonry, the first stone without which the building cannot stand. And so Jesus would be considered the cornerstone of Christianity, right? He is the stone upon which Christianity is built. Now, the Thing that the listener had sent me was basically this pastor in a southern um, American state whipping his congregation up into a bit of a frenzy um, for Israel. And the animals, the Palestinian animals, the Hamas, who had perpetrated this evil attack. And I saw that it was a mega church. Cornerstone was a mega church. And I thought, oh, let's just see if this pastor has a private jet or a mansion or whatever. Well, I couldn't find that. I could not find that. Uh, but what was interesting to me was that I did find that his wife led one of the uh, women's ministry groups affiliated with the church. And I saw a picture of her, and she was a pleasant-looking middle-aged woman heading in well into her 60s, and she had a necklace, one simple piece of jewelry, and it was a Star of David that encircled a cross. And the other thing that I noticed about the Cornerstone Ministry was that they had something on the go all the time. 24-7 for whatever age group that you were in. They had ministries for the very small toddlers and the um, s elementary students and the high school students, and they had a ministry for people 18 to 29 and a ministry for married couples and on and on and on. And the other thing that I noticed this week was the was music and how music all ties into this as well. Uh, one story that I noticed is um, there is a female who was I, I won't I'm sorry I can't pronounce her name correctly but uh, Dalal Abu Amne 
that she is a Palestinian singer and she's currently under house arrest over social media posts. So this is what it says in the BBC from yesterday. Uh, Dozens of Arab citizens of Israel have been arrested in connection with social media posts about the war in Gaza. Among them is a well-known singer and influencer from Nazareth, Dalal Abu Amne, who was held in police custody for two days before being released on Wednesday on bail. She's now under house arrest until Monday. According to her lawyer, Abir Baker, she was accused of disruptive behavior by police officers who said her posts could incite violence among her followers. The post that attracted police attention was an image of the Palestinian flag with the Arabic motto, there is no victor but God. Ms. Baker says the singer, who is well known across the Arab world for her songs about Palestinian heritage, was expressing a religious sentiment. Israeli authorities interpreted the singer's post as a call to arms for Palestinians. The other thing that I noticed was, um, just in digging around, was how long uh, different Christian churches and their youth groups and their praise music have been used in this talk that I am putting up today, which I have not mentioned what I'm putting up, Alan, on Sweet Liberty with Jackie Petru from April the 13th, 2005. It is a good talk. They get into a few good things, but it is because of where how they touch on the World Zionist Federation and... Um, Israel identity, Christian identity, and British Israelism that I I wanted to put this up because what they're talking about, Jackie says, what is it that people don't understand why, you know, that a creator would have a, a chosen people? I mean, that just doesn't reconcile. And Alan said, their thinking would have to overcome their conditioning. That's the problem. And they've been so heavily steeped in this stuff from childhood that for many of them, it's impossible to break that barrier. And they talk about this quite a bit. So it's a good talk. I'm going to put that up. I'm just going to mention the beast system. Now, there are a lot, you know, the beast system, 666, mark of the beast. You take it on your right hand, you take it on your forehead. There are some tablets that were discovered maybe not quite 20 years ago. Newly discovered fragment of the oldest surviving copy of the New Testament indicates that as far as the Antichrist goes, Theologians, scholars, heavy metal groups, and television evangelists have got the wrong number. Instead of 666, it's actually the less ominous 616. And they go on to say that, yes, on this new tablet, this new fragment from the book of Revelation, written in ancient Greek, dating to the late 3rd century, discovered in some historic dumps, in Egypt, a team of expert classicists using photographic techniques are deciphering the original writing, and they are saying that it says 616. Someone writes, uh, this is David Parker, professor of New Testament textual criticism and paleography at the University of Birmingham, thinks that 616 is the original. He says, this is an example of gematria where numbers are based on the numerical values of letters and people's names. Early Christians would use numbers to hide the identity of people who they were attacking. 616 refers to the emperor Caligula. Now, uh, this is one expert's opinion. But it got me thinking about the beast system, the beast in Revelation the beast out of the the sea and the dragon who confers power on this beast out of the sea and the the beast is written about in these traditions in these religious traditions and we talk about the beast system as something that we are going into we will go into the beast system and we will have to take the mark of the beast 
And I was reading something, uh, you know, the, you could say the beast system. All, what is that? That's 24-7 surveillance. That's a social credit system. That is where um, credits are issued. That is where you cannot buy nor sell without the mark of the beast. We'll all worship the beast, the Antichrist. And I was thinking, um, you know, what is what is the beast system? I read something that got me thinking. They said the acceptance of the mark of the beast is not a sudden thing. The worshiping of the Antichrist is not a sudden thing. It's a gradual process. And gradually you come to accept this system and everything within the system. And by the time you are asked to take the mark, for most people, it's really no big deal because they are already fully adapted to the system. And so <clears throat> I'm going to say what I think here, and that is we are born into the beast system. And everything and everybody is used. And Alan would always say, don't join. He'd say, come out of this system and think for yourself. And he would tell you how ancient this was. And because it is so old and we are so well understood, and he talked about it again in this conversation with Jackie Petru, people are afraid of dying. And it is interesting because uh, this week, uh, you know, before I felt unwell, I had started working on the third installment of the Meaning Mentors and Masters a series of clips that I'm doing. And this one I was going to entitle Meaning and Purpose. And Alan started off talking about death and how death comes to all of us, but the fear of death is so known. It's it, They know that people don't know what comes next, and they're afraid of that. They're afraid, does anything come next? And And... and and then they populate your world with all manner of evil and darkness and good versus evil. And you want to be in the best. I heard someone else talking this week, prophecies of end time scenarios, but basically saying, I don't have a dog in this fight in the Middle East because the Orthodox believe such and such. And I thought, wow, I, I, I really can't believe that I'm hearing someone say that they don't have a dog in this fight. Because if you're alive on the earth at this time, you've got a dog in the fight, whether you like it or not. And the reason that you do is because we are born into the beast system, a system where we're run by an ancient priesthood. And we're given sides where religion is the most powerful foundation from which all of this is built. And we are pitted against each other. And people go religion shopping. And one of the reasons they shop for religions is because they're shopping for an insurance policy for what comes next. And this set of rules that I live by if I live by them correctly to the best of my ability, blah, 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 then I've purchased the best insurance policy for the, the hereafter that I can possibly have. And this is why Alan said over and over, and I know people did not like that heterodox approach, that he was not a basher of the Creator. In this talk... Jackie referred to somebody giving him the position that a lot of Christian pastors have where they are just telling, you know, we can sit back and watch what is going on over there because Jesus is coming soon. And it doesn't have anything to do with us. Jesus is coming soon. I am talking about the beast system. And there's plenty of room for infighting in the beast system. You see, they understand that that yearning for the Creator is innate in us. We want to know where did we come from. And many people are seeking back 
to that connection to a creator. And the, the, the system supplies a priesthood, all manner of priests, to make sure you're thinking the right thoughts and you're completely involved in your church's ministry and that ministry is always going to be politicized, always, because they work together. That's the beast system. And I'm not, I, I know there are many sincere pastors that are out there, many sincere people who believe that they are winning souls for salvation in whatever religion and whatever tradition they follow. That is sincere. Alan says in the cutting through near the very, very end of the first volume, page 63, to conquer an evil, we must first disperse into the individual. We must cast off religions, the ties that bind, and stop being afraid. The material world was conquered eons ago by anti-creators, those who could not create, but who could reshape into systems made in their own deviant image. They have been liars and murderers from the beginning. To find truth, we must die to the illusion around and familiar to us. We must one by one allow ourselves to appreciate the true miracles of life and consciousness, which is our birthright. This truth and the ability to achieve it is within everyone. The tiny flame the controllers wish to extinguish, to be truly born again, we must first look within. That would be a nice place to stop. But there's another piece of Alan's writing from about 2007 that I wanted to share with you. A poem, it's a little different than what he would put up to, to accompany a talk. Matrix, Mohammed, Moses, Jesus, Krishna, Brahma, Sarah, Hagar, abortion, end of love, into black hole of night, bated breath to see who brings the light, armies gather for the fight, crusader clash, sword to sword, while science, backed by high accord, sits back, whirlpool of a galaxy, stars in ardent apogee, as above, so below. Medina, stars laid bare, stare. Jesus above the skull will rise. Holy rock, steeped in blood, to all surprise, gives up the blood of sacrifice. UN building consecrated, slaughterhouse behind the faces of charity. Cutting through the matrix, the vortex has appeared. Thousand years of history is streaming. Truth is streaming out, heard above the shouts of propagandizing. Buddha has woken from wish. The smile has gone. Lake, rising, mountain, pierce, air, touch, sun, water, earth, fire. Delilah is delicious with her lies and her kisses. Holy One, wrapped in spirit, sacred intercourse, union, fusion. There's a demon in my TV. There's a demon in the White House. There's a demon in the House of Parliament. There's a demon in uniform, and it is threatening me. The Sephiroth is steaming, and the genies loose again. Sparrows bring no souls to earth, and vultures circle round, adapting to technology, adapting to the changes, adapting to a broken life, goods for people exchanges. Whispers from above, whispers all around, whispers say in the dead of night, earth is the slaughter ground. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us tonight on Sweet Liberty. Today is uh, Wednesday, and it is the uh, 13th 
of April in the year 2005. Alan is with us this evening. Alan Watt is with us this evening. How has your day been besides the uh, chemtrail spraying? I got my truck stuck in the field. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I was taking out there to do some important stuff, and it just it's just not dry enough, eh? Uh, yeah. So did you get it out? No, I I spoke to it quietly and, and left it. Oh, okay. So do you think it's going to come in by itself now? <laughs> well, I did tell it what would happen to it if it didn't. Alan, I, there's a something that I would like to address tonight, I would like you to address. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to respond. I don't know that what I say or the way I say it, what uh, initiated this is that I got a call last night from a really nice man, and, and I mean this sincerely. And I know that what that it's with all of his heart, you know, the, the belief, Mm -hmm. But basically, it was the same thing I get from people who are, I guess it's Christian or Israel identity, mm -hmm. that it isn't Yahweh or Jehovah, mm -hmm. that God of the Old Testament. The name is wrong. It's yes. Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And, Alan, what is the difference? Well, well to them it's everything, really. Um, and that goes way, way back into the Middle East where if you knew the exact pronunciation of the entity or demon, uh, then you would control it. That, that was where it all stems from. And, of course, it's all nonsense, because um, if you're talking to a creator, I'm sure the creator is bright enough to know who you're talking to. <laughs> yeah, what about that uh, part in the Old Testament where it says, if my people would, does it say, know my name or something about repent mm -hmm. uh, but same I wish I, I knew it uh, word for word I don't know if you know which one I'm referring to but I think a lot of stuff is pinned on to that too mm -hmm. if my people would say may say my name or know my name yeah. call upon me I will hear their la heal their land yeah. mm -hmm. so that's to make people think that yet we have to have a name for creator that's pretty well it, 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 it's nonsense I mean if, you, if you're speaking to a creator that's so dumb uh, with a low IQ that if you get the name wrong he, he doesn't hear you then I think you're, you're praying to the, the wrong entity uh -huh. because uh, obviously uh, anything that was a creator knows exactly what you're, uh, who you mean well but this goes along with the fact that it <coughs> wasn't the Jews that were the chosen it was the white Anglo-Saxon and, and there's a lot of evidently research that people have done into bloodlines and mm -hmm. and people from back in that uh, area yeah. and, and so uh, what it comes down to is this it comes down to believing that Creator uh, would choose a special people and, and were to rule the world mm -hmm. Uh, rule the world it says in there Alan yep. that you are going to loan to nations and borrow from none yeah. and it also says to a special people that they cannot lo uh, loan money uh, charge usury mm -hmm. to their fellow uh, fellows but they have to charge usury to the stranger mm -hmm. or the goyim yeah. well how how do the, how is this reconciled in people's minds or is there something that you uh, that at least to plant a seed that, that would get them thinking Alan well well, their thinking would have to overcome their conditioning that's the problem and uh, they've been so heavily steeped in this stuff uh, from childhood that for many of them it's impossible to break that barrier well, um, a lot of people who are Christian identity, mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily from childhood. It is what they deduced uh, from whoever... This came from British Israelism, didn't it? This Israel identity or yeah, right. Christian identity? Yeah. What is British Israelism? It, it began in the 1800s with uh, one man who was a bit of a nutcase to begin with. 
in, in fact he ended up in, a, in, in, in um, a psychiatric hospital for the rest of his days. Who, 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 what, do you know a name? I can't quite mention, remember the guy's name. Okay. But uh, he want, he actually demanded that, that the king and queen of England uh, dethrone themselves and, and put him in power because he, he believed that he was closer to the bloodline uh, that was mentioned um, th than they were, you see. So they locked him up. However, then the World Zionist Federation uh, realized this could be a, an aid in their plans, and so they pushed it ever since. And you'll find that the World Federalist Society... World Federalist or World Zionist? World Federalist Society. Okay. It's the exact same address in every country as the World Zionist Society. It's one and the same outfit. So they're, they're using religion once again to verify uh, the Old Testament and uh, and to, to bring Israel up to be the, the, the basically the capital of the planet. Yeah, and, the, and, and going along with that... Isn't it the second coming, mm -hmm. the uh, the coming of the Jesus, and that his? Uh, from what I understand, I don't know if this is British Israelism or uh, Israel identity, but uh, that Jesus is going to have his throne right there in Jerusalem. Yeah, it's, it's all it's all you know part of the, the plan. Uh, it, and, and you see, behind religions, you've had people who've conned everyone. Um, for thousands of years, so they do certainly have know the techniques to use, and and uh, they, they could pull it off. You know, they could certainly pull it off. But um, if you go into the Old Testament, uh, Jehovah or, or Yahweh is a latecomer. He he comes on the scene after the Elohim, and the Elohim are, are the, the the creators, you might say. And so, definitely, Yahweh was a was a a local deity. Yeah. That was then pushed. In fact, he was the volcano god, and, and he was eventually pushed up to overtake everyone else, not by Jews, but by the the ruling governments of the day. And the priesthood. <laughs> yeah, and um, Constantine, I'm sure, had a good a good few chuckles at that one, because he was steeped in all the mystery of religion. And um, even though he's he's given the, the, the accolades for bringing Christianity to the fore, he did not uh, make Christianity the the religion of Rome. He simply stopped the persecution of it. And the week prior to doing that, he he created um, his own temple of the Mithraic cult. He was a Mithraic uh, disciple. So Constantine, a, a form of of masonry, you might call it. And he also created um, a, a, a church where you, you could go in, uh, like all um, uh, Caesars, and worship him in his own church. So uh, he was he was worshipped as a god, you know. He, he he had insurance policies out with with every mystery religion, and so he used uh, this religion, the Christian religion, to further um, the cause which was, again, to lead eventually to world government, you know. Uh-huh. I've mentioned this on the air before because I don't really understand all of the writings that are attributed to sayings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But there are some that are so simple yeah. and that you just absolutely know is true, uh, you know, uh, how to live, you know, do unto others. Yeah. yeah that, that is it. Mm -hmm. Alan, uh, as you would have other, but um, as you sow, so shall you reap. Mm -hmm. uh, that I take that literally, and you know, for people to think that, okay, well, you know, if I say a certain amount of hail marys or the priest, or I pay enough, or uh, well, you know, the Lord knows that I'm a weak sinner and Jesus died for my sins, so mm -hmm. I'm okay because I repent. And then you, you do it again and you repent again and um, it, it, it really gives people a cop out. But far beyond that, the way I see it, the way it appears to me, is that it has created that separation, that perceived separation between each of us and our Creator. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, long before Christianity, the, the mystery religions had always been around. And uh, they, they knew from time immemorial that uh, man would always seek out his creator. He had a yearning uh, to, to be in touch with the all, or whatever ever, ever name they gave to it. And, and, and then they exploited it. The priesthoods actually exploited this, this natural need, you see. Mm-hmm. And, of course, out of the need, they, they create dogma. And uh, from the dogma, they make, they make rules and laws and, and enslave the minds of the people. And if you don't go buy into the dogma, you're a heretic. Yeah, yeah. And I, I remember saying that on the air. Actually, it was sometime in 98... And why I remember that is because it was still daylight when I was doing the broadcast at the time. Yeah. But I said, I just want you all to know that I am a heretic. Mm-hmm. And what, and, you know, by the definition in the, um, in the, in the dictionary that I do not ascribe or subscribe to the religious doctrine and the religious dogma that we have been taught. Mm-hmm. And I had somebody call me and say, that's a terrible thing to say about yourself. It is, it, it that is, in other words, it's terrible to to be a heretic. Well, yeah, her- heretic comes from from, from hearsay, and uh, that, that's what they forbid the public to to do was listen to hearsay, and from from hearsay you have heresy. That's where it comes from. So you are forbidden to listen to any kind of of, of hearsay or I heresy, see. and if you did, then you were a heretic. So, so it's a fantastic form of mind control to do with guilt tripping um, and sin, of course. And it's been exploited and used by professionals for thousands and thousands upon years. It's it's all mind control, all of it. You know. I uh, I remember when Rick, what was his name, Wildstein was on actually he was on this hour on this shortwave uh, frequency at 9 p.m. Eastern Time and uh, Lily listened to him and taped a thing one day and called and let me hear hear it and this basically was his message he's saying you know because he used to do news and tell all the terrible things that were going on Uh but then he'd say but that's okay I see what's going on out there I know what's going on but it's okay because I know that it's because it's the time Jesus is coming see Mm -hmm. and then he says come on Jesus he says and establish your throne in Jerusalem and I am going to be in there in the right in the front row Mm -hmm. you know worshiping you and following you and and uh, that it seems that the kingdom on earth is the message that is permeated be, be, be throughout a lot of these religions, like you know the Jehovah's Witnesses and yeah, uh, and of course you, the, the history of the, the Witnesses was began by um, Charles Case Russell. Russell. Yeah, yeah, and, and he's buried under under a pyramid. Thirty four holy. I was at his pyramid. I have photographs of them, Alan. Yeah, and it's right opposite the Masonic Lodge, you know. Yes, and of course the whole idea of the Russellites, as they call themselves. Was, was that the, the Gentiles had blown it with all their wars and, and, and the goal was to bring uh, the time of the Jews to rule the world. That was part of the, the Russellite philosophy. Oh, you're kidding. No. In fact, that, that, uh, Balfour, who gave the Balfour de- uh, Declaration, said the same thing. If you read the whole declaration, and generally you'll see only part of it published, but if you read the whole thing... He said the same thing, that the Gentiles had blown uh, their ability for salvation, were unable to handle freedom, and therefore uh, the Jews had the right to I have never read the whole thing then, because what I have, that I was under the impression that this was the Balfour Declaration, uh-huh. basically it just said that, you know, that a, a home uh, there will be established for the Jews, However, it said something about that this would not encroach upon the people who are living there already in the Palestinians. Well, they are nice liars. You know. Yeah, I know that, but uh, that's all I've got. Yeah, I've got the whole thing. And, and, and don't forget, too, it was not a, a British government 
document. It was a it was a personal letter to Baron Rothschild. Yeah. So it never went. It was never debated in Parliament in Britain. Uh, this was a, a a managed thing between Rothschild and Balfour. But that was the the the, 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 the scheme of it all. Was was that well? Look, you 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 Gentiles just can't handle it. So. Uh, it's only right that the, that the Jews take over. H.G. Wells, who was also a frontman for MI6, and who who was given most of his material that, that he wrote um, his stories around, H.G. Uh, Wells was also he categorized the races that would should be allowed to live, and the ones that would have to be exterminated, long before Adolf Hitler came along. And he he said that the British Crown had decided that that the Jews, because of their survival abilities and their ability to handle this economic system, uh, would be allowed to to survive alongside uh, the arist the aristocracy of Britain. <laughs> You're kidding. No. Well, so their ability to handle it, they're the ones that, well. The elite are the ones that created it, aren't they? Yes. From way back in ancient times? Oh, yes. It's always been uh, the elite, of course, yeah. You know... No, when you, when you read into the, to the books, H.G. Um, uh, Wells wrote... Um, uh, the, the, the first set was a two-volume set uh, called A History of the World, and he lays out there the races that would have to be destroyed because they could not come into this new order which was an economic system and he said that the red men would have to be killed off by diseases oh boy they and, did that. and so would the blacks he also had the Irish in there by the way yeah. why the Irish because the Irish have a temperamental streak where they don't like to go along with the systems uh -huh. and the only ones who would be allowed to survive would, would be people who would conform uh, to an economic system and, and that's the key to everything is the economic system we uh, under law exist to serve the economic system and not the other way around yeah, yeah. So, so yeah they, they wrote uh, a lot of, the, of their agenda uh, openly back in the early 1900s and, uh, and put down in that, that agenda the races that would have to be eliminated well, you know, when you read enough different stuff, you know, you keep seeing these connections, Alan. Yes. And in the protocols, of course, their their world court, is. it looks like it's already built mm -hmm. there in Israel. Yeah. But they say that their king despot mm -hmm. of the blood of Zion is going to be the pope of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I was sharing with our listeners last night a thing that I got uh, on the different popes <laughs> and but there's something here that I didn't get to and I think it's it, it's part of our conversation right now and I'd like to share it uh, they were t he was talking about the scandals of the uh, the, the child molestation mm -hmm. and he said notwithstanding the scandal and shock of the aforementioned Rome carries on quietly with her program of world dominion. They lead the competition to establish the first one world system that has ever existed. Their ultimate goal is global religious syncretism and to eventually wield control and authority over every individual on earth. The human solidarity goals of the Roman Church are identical to the goals and objectives of the United Nations. This is why they're such a perfect fit. Rome only gives the appearance of objecting to the UN agenda. At the 1996 World Food Summit in Rome, Cardinal An Angelo Sadana pledged the Holy See's support for the UN's humanistic programs of action. Rome also has designs on Jerusalem. Now this is where the connection comes in. Mm -hmm. For 46 years after Israel's rebirth, the Vatican refused to acknowledge Israel's right to exist. But Rome wants to exert premier influence over Jerusalem, which will one day function as the capital of her world church. Mm -hmm. In a 1993 letter to the Pope, Sh Shimon Peres promised 
to internationalize Jerusalem, granting the UN political control of the old city and the Vatican hegemony over the holy sites within. This was confirmed by the Italian newspaper La Stampa. In March 95, the Israel, uh, Israeli radio station Arut Shiva was leaked a cable from the Israeli embassy in Rome confirming the handover of Jerusalem to the Vatican. The future Pope, excuse me, the future Pope will establish his throne one day within the walls of the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. It is from here that he will rule his world at church. Well, that reminds me that the king despot of the blood of Zion is said that that, that will be the Pope of the world. Mm-hmm. And, and it says, and there's just another paragraph here, and this day may not be as far off as many believe. The cornerstones of the third temple have already been quarried by the Jewish group known as the Temple Mount Faithful. They're extremely well financed and organized. They've also produced priestly vestments in accordance with scriptural outlines and are properly, or excuse me, presently attempting to breed a perfect red heifer in anticipation of the coming dedication ceremonies. Obviously, Rome and the Temple Mount faithful are headed for a showdown. I don't think so. And do you, Alan? (laughs) I don't think it's going to be a showdown. No, I I wouldn't think so. Okay, here's the last. In a letter sent to the Vatican in July 2004, the Temple Mount faithful demanded that Pope John Paul return the Temple Menorah and other vessels and treasures removed in 70 A.D. by Titus and taken to Rome where they're presently held within the secret Vatican archives. And that's the end of the article, and this was written by some guy in Toronto. But I think there's a lot of truth in here, uh, except that there's going to be a showdown. There's, this, this last pope, according to different many sources, his mother was a Jew. He, he, you know, he went to Israel and, uh, and, and apologized on behalf of all Christians for the terrible persecution of the Jews that have taken place over the past 2,000 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the, the guy was a Jew. Well, he, he also worked for I.G. Farben uh, just prior to World War II. Yep. And he was not a Jew. Uh, he, he, he became a Catholic. I understand that he became a Catholic in order to escape uh, whatever. Yeah. And then well, he became a cardinal, and the next thing you know, he's a pope. There's yeah. not going to be any showdown. Mm-hmm. Their their people are their puppets are being put in place right now. Oh, sure, but the, the Catholic Church was always used for this. You know. Yeah. In, in fact, if you, if you look at some of the big names of of, of Catholic popes, uh, they were also world bankers in their own rights. You know. I was telling our listeners last night about this beautiful book I have written by uh, uh, Yallop, David Yallop, I think his name was. Uh, it was titled In God's Name, and it was about Pope John Paul I mm-hmm. that was in only for 33 days. Yeah. And he was going to get rid of Marchenko, the Vatican banker, because he found out that they had laundered a billion, 900 and some million mm-hmm. dollars of bad bonds through the Vatican Church. Yeah. And it was the night before when he handed uh, these instructions to his Secretary of State, which he had uh, actually inherited from the previous Pope. Mm-hmm. And it, the, the the author said that the guy begged Pope not to do this, evidently knowing what was going to happen. And he said, I want this done. And Marchenko, of course, was going to be gone. Marchenko was some bishop or cardinal. Mm-hmm. And um, and the next morning he was found dead. He was poisoned. Yeah, and, and he was going to make a speech that day too uh, to ban uh, Freemasonry in the Vatican. Yes, uh, three. What is it called? Three two p. Three p. There's um two th- p two two p two p two Freemasonry. Yeah. Yes, that 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 was mentioned. We we have to take our sixty second place here. I know that uh, if you happen to be a new listener, sometimes when Alan gets talking about ancient history, he, he can blow your mind away. 
because he that's what happened when he first began coming on with us and I kept making qualifying statements and saying to our listeners now just because Alan Watt is saying this doesn't mean it's so I mean I don't know that it isn't but I cannot verify it because I haven't done the research I don't we don't have access to many of the books that Alan has read and and has and um, and then the next thing you know, listeners started sending me saying, look at this, look at this. This is exactly what Alan said. And finally what Alan did was put together a booklet that gave, um, it, it, there's, there's um, photocopies of pages out of the books and his own writing explaining what you are seeing and what each of those things means. And, and I think that if you have not, well, even if you have been a long-time listener and have heard Alan a lot of times, you will very much appreciate the books. So we were talking, what were we talking about? Just Well, well the fact is um, organized religion has always been used uh, for the purpose of control. Uh, from the most ancient times. Oh yeah, we were talking about Pope John Paul the First. And if you want, to, if, you, if you really want to find mystery religion, you simply look into the established churches because that's where it, it, it all began. You know the word pagan. Yeah. Well, I looked it up one day. I, I I got a whole bunch of dictionaries here, and every time Chuck found one in a old bookstore, it all different from all different eras. And I looked up the word pagan in every single one of them, including Webster's uh, uh, 1828, whatever. Pagan, the word is, is connected with the word heathen, and that is a person of the heath. That is, yes. pagan is, really means rural folk. Mm -hmm. But what the dictionary said is that they were people who did not come into the organized church, the doctrine and the dogma of the church. And Alan, do you know that almost every single one of them, one of the definitions of a pagan was a Gentile? Yeah. Now, how I, that kind of confused me. Yeah. Well, can you explain that? Well, sure. I mean, I mean all, all ancient peoples, uh, had meaning in life. They had meaning from life. They, they lived uh, the meaning of life, and it didn't matter really um, where the, their source of inspiration came from. They, they lived their life, and, and uh, life has to be meaningful. If you take away uh, the meaningfulness of life, then you have um, robots and slaves. And of course, the, the organized religions were, were intended and, and set up to do exactly that. The ancient people had special sacred spots all over the world. And uh, it meant something to them. That's all important, you see. Yeah, and it wasn't necessarily evil, was it, Alan? No, not in the least. No, not in the least. In fact, there's, there's far less bloodletting uh, with the so-called Pagani. Um, as, as there has been with established religion. But established what about religion has, has been a horror show. Alan, what about the people, now, I guess, I've thought of them as pagans, but who sacrifice their children. Yep. Like I remember reading in Hawaii, you know, they throw their babies into the ocean, yeah. sacrificing them to the gods. Mm -hmm. Some of them, when they put a, built a building, the four corners, before they put those posts in, yeah. an infant was thrown in there. Mm -hmm. where, where did that did that come from? The priesthood. It came from Babylon. And in fact, the archaeologists today, who've worked steadily from what, what was Babylon uh, right into Jerusalem, have found no uh, sign of of, of uh, a Jehovah site worship. What they have found. Is it the same exact Malik. system of Babylon where you, you killed children and often put them in an urn and you put them on each, each four corners to, to protect the inhabitants? So, so, so all this rubbish and nonsense about a, a great um, Judaic people who, who worship this Jehovah 
is, is absolute rubbish uh, the proof is in the earth the proof is there it's buried in the earth and, and in fact you can't tell Judaism apart from the, the Phoenicians who also did the same thing uh, of killing firstborn children and, and burying them in the four uh, corners of, of the structure you see in the ancient times um, even in Rome uh, the, the emperor himself to open up land for building purposes he would make the crossroads with the plough and he would plough uh, in an exact square and everywhere that who, who, did, who did this? Uh, the, 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 the old uh, Caesars ok the Caesars themselves yeah that was the law ok that they had to, to, to plough a, a square part of the land with a plough and uh, wherever any structure went up then a sacrifice was given a human sacrifice um, so that the mother goddess would not be offended that was the belief system and and that was rampant that same belief system is exactly the same system as Babylon and Jerusalem uh, and on and on you go uh, the um, Caesar are you speaking of in Rome? Uh, in Rome and their empire yeah. wherever their empire extended to it was uh -huh. the same system because there is only one mystery religion you mean the Romans were doing uh, baby sacrifices? yeah, yeah. And even even today, uh, in the lands uh, of the so-called Phoenicians, which was uh, the Holy Land, basically. Well, okay, tell me where that was. That was the Holy Land. That was Jerusalem and round about Jerusalem. That was Phoenicia, huh? Uh huh. And and the Greeks called that area um, the land of the Phoenicia. South of them was the Edomites, but uh, that land itself was was the Phoenicians. Aren't the Edomites the one the Jews? supposedly are supposed to get rid of well you'll find they were not too happy with anybody else you know unless yeah. they everybody was their enemy basically but what you find with, with, with the Phoenicians and, and this is the key to it all is, it's an economic system and the Phoenicians were the ones who lived in that area who always created an artificial island um, artificial off, what? Uh, they, they would always create an artificial island. Island? Uh -huh. and, and that was their capital. And uh, from there they oh. would spread their system of commerce all over the ancient world. You mean somewhere out in the ocean? Somewhere out in the ocean. They would create an island? Yeah, a, ma a, man, a man made island. How do you do that, Alan? They, they poured millions and billions of tons of, of, of soil and stone and so on and then they built their island they would find in other words sort of like a shoal or something that was fairly already fairly uh, not deep uh -huh. fairly shallow yeah and, and that's what they did and they built it off of uh, Joppa off, off the coast of, of, of Israel and the Mediterranean Sea and, and that was their capital and then when they moved eventually to Venice Venice is a play on Phoenician. Uh, Venetian. Phoenician. Uh -huh. Same thing. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And that was the capital of Venetian the world. Venetian red, and, yeah. and Venice itself, again, w was created by uh, man, by, by the creation of, of an artificial city. And so the MO, uh, you, you can trace down through history where would they go. Yes, and this gets so confusing because. I read a fairly long piece about Venice. I think it was Venice where the um, the Jesuits were supposed to be so powerful. Mm -hmm. Is that so? Was it Venice? Well, they were definitely powerful because the, the, um, the Jesuits traveled even to ancient uh, Japan. Uh, they created the warrior caste of Japan. It wasn't uh, natural to, the, to that country. Uh, they, they actually gave them the warrior caste and uh, they've, they've done it wherever they've gone uh -huh. if you say um, Venetian Venetian and Venetian it's the same thing you see yeah it, 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 you know and the phoenix bird died Venetian red 100 years the phoenix bird uh huh 
and, and it's recreated in its own image. And that would be take off on the Phoenicians? That's right. And, and you'll find, if you say Jesus, um, and, and then take it in, into the French, you have Je suis, I am. Jesuit. Je suis. Uh, Jesuit is Je suis. Same thing, I am. Uh, the whole thing is the mystery religion. All of it is, is the mystery religion. And uh, are you saying, well, now I have read that the one we know is Jesus, but that wasn't really his name. Yeah, Jesus is a Greek term. Yeah. Because the, the, the initial writers of the Gospels wrote primarily in Greek, and they had no problem by saying son of the Zeus, Zeus, Jesus, uh, because they, they, they were familiar with, with, with the son of, of, of Zeus, Jesus. Jesus. The other name is Apollo, of course. And uh, Jesus is the son, you know. He is the S-U-N. If you look at the King James Bible, you, uh, and, and you, you get a proper King James Bible. You mean like the original one? Yeah, you, you'll find that the, the accolades that they give to King James says you are the S-U-N. King James is the S-U-N. And then you talk about the, the late Queen, Elizabeth I, who is the Eastern Star. That's where the Eastern Star Lodge comes from. That's in all the original King James Bibles. All Masonic. It's all Masonic, yeah. So these, these, these guys have um, literally pulled the wool over everyone's eyes for thousands of years. Um, you, you look at all the churches that aspire, which is the phallic symbol, uh, going right back to Egypt, and it's called On, and the, the phallic symbol is called On, it's in the English language today, we use On for an erection. And you, you walk through the phallic symbol into the box, and you walk through the, the, the vulva that's why you have a, what they call a Norman arch and you walk through it into the church into the box and it always face, faces to the east where the sun comes up is this in the Catholic church mostly? it's in all all uh, Christian churches well, are you saying then that all Christian churches that the entrance, fa entrance faces east? that's right gosh I never noticed that Alan and uh the Be guy gets dressed up in, in his robe, uh, which is a, a female dress, because he portrays the, the hermaphrodite, male and female in one. Because in the beginning, God created man and woman, and his perfect image created them both. Which means, that, and, and this is in, in the Talmud, that uh, the God they're talking about is, is a hermaphrodite, is male and female in one. They worship on Saturn's day, which is Saturday, and that's why they wear the black robe. When they wear the black robe, they are also ultimate law. They are all law. Is that what the black robe means? That's what it means. What? It's law. It's the law. Black? That's why, why judges wear the black robe. They are the law. They are Saturn. They, when they sit on that bench, above the people and there's a bar in the way they belong to the bar they are speaking as God they are God in, in the courtroom in the courtroom yep. so, uh, uh, how does law connect with black? Uh, it, it's again the ancient system that predated Judaism and, and, and all the rest of them you mean that's what they did was wore black? yes and, and when they brought even Hebrews in uh, for, for trial, uh, they, this is how they said it, you know, they held them by the short and curlies. They held them by the, you know what? The pubic hair. By the D A L L S. The oh. Bowel, you know. And uh, if you lied, they crushed, they crushed it, they crushed your manhood. And that's where the short and curlies comes from. Oh, jeez. Yep. And, and this is all history, it is recorded history. Um, 
and, and, and we've been fooled for such a long, long time with all this nonsense that we have not allowed ourselves to live. And these guys who run this system um, know exactly where they're taking us and what they're taking us to. And they have decided that uh, they want to eradicate that part of the mind, the brain, which allows you to think of yourself as an individual. Okay, what part of the brain is that? Uh, it's your higher survival centers. Uh, Arthur Kessler worked for the United Nations. He wrote about it. He said we will have to lobotomize that part of the brain that gives them their individuality because they won't need it anymore since the state will be making all their decisions for them. Are we talking about in the pituitary area? It's, 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 it, it, it also like a frontal lobotomy? Yeah, it, yeah, it includes that. It includes that. They've, they've been right up front with their agenda. Uh, Alan, was it Arthur Kessler who wrote... What, what did... The 13th Tribe. Okay, I know the 13th Tribe, but what about the the ghost in the machine? The ghost in the machine is, is what they refer to your ability for... To, to, to know yourself as a distinct personality. Wasn't that a book? Uh, the Ghost of the Machine was a book, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it Kessler who wrote that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Arthur Kessler? Yeah, he worked for the, for, the, for the United Nations on a way to eradicate what they call the problem <sighs> of individuality. So you know what had just occurred to me? Mm -hmm. These psychotropic drugs that they're putting everybody on, Mm -hmm. Do you think that that does something with that frontal lobe of the brain? Do you think that that's a way of chemically lobotomizing people, Alan? They are doing it. That's what the spraying in the sky is all about. Well, yeah, but that's for, besides the spraying in the sky, mm -hmm. uh, the psychotropic drugs yeah. that they're putting so many people on and so many children, mm -hmm. do you think that that is sort of like a chemical... I mean, they actually get zombie-like in a sense. I guess it shrinks the brain. When you put them on the drugs that have been put on, it actually shrinks the brain. And what they're doing is eliminating all those people with leadership abilities who can, can, can convey what they, they understand and know and have learned to other people. They're eliminating them before they become a problem. And this is not uh, fantasia. It's been written about by the very people involved. It's just that no one reads these books. So the ghost in the machine would be the actual soul or spirit of the soul of the individual? It's everything that, that makes you who you are. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. uh-huh. Yeah, that's what they mean. And they're doing it. I've always meant to get that book and I've never done it. Mm-hmm. And Arthur Kessler was quite candid about it. He, he believes in it, of course. He worked for Stalin, and then he came over to the University of, of uh, New York and taught the same theories there. Kessler was a Russian Jew? Yeah. And then he, he also uh, uh, spent the rest of his life working on, on methods to eradicate that part of the brain that makes you who you are an individual you know what just occurred to me that when people who live in cities that every opportunity that they get to leave the city and find a place Alan uh, that is you know where the birds sing and the, the crickets there aren't too many crickets around anymore that I know of but you know the little peeper frogs yeah and the whippoorwills and the morning doves and the mockingbirds and just to get out and away from the artificiality of the city. And, and I really mean this, folks. I truly mean this from the bottom of my heart. If you haven't done it, take a vacation, take a weekend, take your <coughs> children, take yourselves, get the hell out of the city and find a place where... Water runs, 
a, a, a little brook, a stream, a river, but go someplace where there aren't telephones. Buy a tent and go camping. Alan, how, how else are people ever going to be able to get in touch with themselves? Well, the, the time is running out because the agenda is there. It, you, you, it, it's ongoing very quickly now. Huh. And uh, you will find that those who are dead already, that they're dead in the world, that the few who are truly awake are often caught up in confusion. Yeah. Um, there are very few people who are truly awake who have broken through all the confusion. Uh-huh. But but the agenda is going on right now. Seti, the Egyptian pharaoh Seti, We're out of time. was the was the one who put into effect uh, the the long range plan to lobotomize the public. Alan, and that's why you have Seti. Seti, we're out of time. We're out of our hour. Let me put it that way. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back with you Monday. Thank you for being here tonight. Now and thank you.